Pastor Ben doesn't realize is that when you wear socks in the baptismal, it's more to clean up because they <laughs> hold a lot of water. So <laughs> let's open up our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, brothers and sisters. Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 10 for our sermon text. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. I'm going to read this text and then pray and then we'll jump in. This is the word of the Lord. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. The Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us now as we come into your word to see your glory, to be changed by your spirit, to glorify your name as we worship you in the text and in response to the text, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. It was 1992 and I was entering the sixth grade at Parkview Intermediate in Pasadena, Texas, and among all of the new experiences on the first day of school, I walked into the band hall and to my first band class to meet with Miss Pergley. Each student during band class took that first, that first class to meet with Miss Pergley and talk about which instrument that they wanted to play. And then she gave us different mouthpieces to try out to see which instrument would be a good fit for us. And I wanted to play the saxophone. Apparently, there were a lot of other people who wanted to play the saxophone too. Alas, I did not get to play the saxophone. Ms. Pergley said, here, why don't you try buzzing on this trumpet mouthpiece? And so I did, and the saxophone dreams were over. But the reason for this is a good one. There were a lot of people that wanted to play the saxophone. There were plenty of people who wanted to play the snare drum and be in the percussion section. But Miss Pergley knew something about the band. She knew that if a band was only made up of saxophone players and snare drum players, then it's not going to be very pleasing to the ear. Unless, of course, you're a saxophone player or a snare drum player. But the monotony is not something that tends to be pleasing for us to listen to. A band requires unified diversity. In order for it to be uh, an experience that we enjoy that we can appreciate more with, with depth and nuance and different instruments blending together in harmony. It really needs unified diversity, much like the church. The church requires unified diversity. Last week, Pastor Ben preached through chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, explaining to us Paul's call to unity and the cause of the unity that believers share. Those are the two points last week. We saw the call to unity and the cause of unity. The Ephesians were to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, verse 3, knowing that the unity they'd been given through Christ is something they already possessed. Maintain the unity that you have been given and as we put God's glory on display in his cosmic theater, as we've been discussing, we do so together. We put God's glory on display in his cosmic theater together. We do so united, brothers and sisters, united in Christ. What our text reveals to us today is that our diversity is another way in which we put God 
on display. Our diversity. We have both unity and diversity through the gospel. You could say that verses one through six that we covered last week is gospel unity. And in verses seven through 10, in our context today, we see gospel diversity. Gospel unity and gospel diversity. Now, this whole context in really verses one through 16 is a big section on the unity and the function of the church. But Paul stops and again makes sure to highlight Jesus Christ here, to highlight Jesus, the one who is responsible for our diversity. Jesus Christ is the one who is responsible for our diversity. So we're going to highlight him and the two points that we're gonna draw out of this section of scripture. We see in this text, number one, Christ is generous. And we also see Christ is victorious. Those two, Christ is generous and Christ is victorious. Both of these points will help us to see just how important our diversity is for faithful church ministry. And so... Let us look to point number one. Christ is generous. Look with me at verse seven once again, and I'll read it. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Christ gives grace here. But we must ask the question in this, what kind of diversity are we referring to? If we need unified diversity, if we have gospel, we have gospel unity and gospel diversity, what do we do? What do we mean by diversity? Is it ethnicity? Is that what we're talking about? Is it social class? Is Is it age? No, it's none of those things. That's not what this text is about. None of those things. Actually, what he means in this diversity is gifting for ministry, different giftings for ministry that Christ himself gives to his people. In verses four through six, we saw the word one, right? The word one is used seven different times to emphasize the unity of believers in that first section in chapter four. But now in verse seven, notice the shift that Paul brings. It's a shift by using the phrase, each one of us each one of us. He's talking about the, the, the unity in, in one through six, right? One body, one spirit, one hope, right? One faith, one baptism, one, one God and father of all. He, he's highlighting the unity there, but then he turns in verse seven and says, to each one of us. Grace was given to each one of us. See, the church is bound together in Christ but each member of the church individually receives grace from Christ for the purpose of serving his body. John Stott says it like this. In reference to this text, Paul is not referring to saving grace. He's referring to serving grace. Certainly, we are saved by grace through faith. We saw that in chapter two. He's already dealt with saving grace. Now he's talking about serving grace, the grace given to each of us so that we might serve the body. Look with me at a couple of cross references that will help us unpack this a bit more. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter four, verse 10. Speaking of this gifting, this, this serving grace. 1 Peter chapter four, Verse 10. As each has received a gift, Peter says, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Okay, let's look at another text. Hold that one kind of in the back of your mind real quick and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses four through seven. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, four through seven. Speaking of this serving grace, this individual gifting. Verse four, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. 
and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In these texts, what we see is that grace is given to believers and it is a varied grace. It is manifested differently throughout the body of Christ. That's what we mean by varied grace. We have different giftings. But we also see that this varied grace has a specific purpose, and that is service, right? The common good. Serve one another with your grace. Our diversity is in the different ways Christ has gifted us for ministry. This is highly practical, brothers and sisters. Highly practical. Listen to this um, from Clinton Arnold, this quotation. He says, the purpose of this varied distribution is not to differentiate the individuals, but for each to contribute to the overall unity and growth of the body. The gifting that we receive from Christ is much different. It's, it's actually it, it's in contrast to the way that the world thinks about talent and skills and abilities. The way that the world and our flesh often thinks about talent or skills is to think of how those talents can set us apart or make us stand out. Isn't that true? My gifts, my abilities, my skills, so that I can stand out, so that attention can be drawn to me, so that I can get the acclaim, the promotion, the respect, the position. Talents are so often in the world used for serving self, for self-service, but in the context of the unity of the body that we see in this text, we know this can't be what Paul is thinking about. We're not given these gifts, this grace, so that we can draw attention to ourselves and set ourselves apart. No, this grace is given to each one of us, not for serving self, but for serving the saints. That's the purpose. Not for serving self, but for serving the saints, for the body. This is consistent, is it not, with the big idea or the melodic line that we've been talking about for the book of Ephesians, that in God's cosmic theater, the church stands center stage to highlight the glory of God through the gospel and through the spirit empowering us. See, we serve the body by his grace to highlight God, not to highlight ourselves not to differentiate us and promote us, but God. So with that in mind, what should be your response if you are not thanked for using your gift in the church? If you give of your service in some way and it, you felt it, it was sacrificial, you, and, and you expected to be thanked by someone in some way, but no one noticed and no one says a thing, or maybe they even reject your service. And what should you think with this in mind? How should your heart respond? And brothers and sisters, don't let it lead you to anger. Don't let it lead you to self-pity. It was never meant to make you stand out, was it? No, this... <laughs> This isn't America's Got Talent, right? The church is not that. If you're using your serving grace to serve Christ's body, then Christ is pleased no matter how his body reacts because you're doing what he called you to do, what he empowered you to do, what he gifted you to do, regardless of the reaction of those around you. The Lord is pleased I think we also need to focus more intently on another aspect of this verse that's going to help us know how we ought to be thinking about our grace, this serving grace that's been given. Look with me at the text again. Verse 7. It says that this grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. According to the measure of Christ's 
gift. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that Christ is in charge of the gift giving. He's in charge of it. I like what this commentator says. He says, Christ does not apportion gifts in a random way, but according to his plan. He is the one who chooses who will receive what gift and determines the amount of the gift that each person will receive. That's what he means here, which, which means that we ought to be thinking thoughts like this. Oh, God's not grabbing handfuls of these gifts, of this grace, and just casting it out across the church indiscriminately. No. I mean, he's, he's not just saying, well, that's what came out of the pinata. Sorry. No, he's not choosing a name out of the hat while he's closing his eyes. That's not what he's doing with this serving grace. Instead, like what this author says, this gift of grace is a precisely tailored suit that fits each one of us perfectly. That's your grace, your, your gifting that he gave you like a tailored suit to fit you for the service of the body and the glory of God. The serving grace you have is not what was left over after the best of it was already handed out. No, there's no such thing as subpar grace. There's no such thing as bottom of the barrel grace when it comes to serving grace. You have the exact gifting that Christ planned for you to have. Are you not satisfied with it? Do you speak of your gift in disparaging terms? Are you envious of the gift of others? I think we've probably all, to one degree or another, had thoughts like that. But don't act like Christ made a bad choice. No, don't act like he didn't know what he was doing when he apportioned your gift to you. And remember, your gift isn't about you. My gifts aren't about me, right? Your gifts aren't about you. Jesus knows what his church needs to function properly. And he has chosen specifically the individuals that would have those gifts so that the church will be healthy in its function. Think of an aircraft carrier. I looked up on the internet that, that on every Nimitz class aircraft carrier, there is over 6,000 personnel. Does that mean 6,000 pilots? 6,000 fighter pilots? No, it's absolutely not. These are different people with different abilities and different jobs and different roles, all doing what they're called to do so that that aircraft carrier can function the way it needs to function optimally. Different jobs, different functions, different abilities, different skills. All, what would happen if all these people just said, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget my task, forget my role and my skills, I'm running to the top. And I, I want to be a fighter pilot now. If everyone's vying for that and fighting for that position, then nothing would get done. There wouldn't be no optimal function for that aircraft carrier. I went on to play the, the trumpet for several years. But you know what? An orchestra doesn't sound good if all you've got is trumpet. Someone's got to play the oboe. Have you ever heard anybody play the oboe? It's a beautiful instrument. We need oboes and we need bassoons in the symphony, don't we? so they can sound like this beautiful composition of music with different parts and harmonies and different sounds all coming together, unified diversity, so it can function optimally. Do you trust Jesus' choice of serving grace for you? Do you trust him? He gave his life to save you. You trust him for the grace that's necessary for your soul to be saved, right? Do you trust him for the grace necessary for you to serve in the church too? Do you trust him? If so, then pray about how you can use your gift more 
If so, embrace that gift and get busy using it and, and developing it for the good of this body by the grace that he supplies, by the Spirit's power. Maybe you're wondering if you were overlooked in the distribution of this grace. No, it can't be possible because we believe the word of God. And the word of God says, each one of us, right? It says the grace has been given to each one of us. So no one's been overlooked. This grace is varied, but it is for everyone. Praise Jesus for this generosity, for this gift. He generously saves us by his grace, but the grace doesn't stop there. He, he doesn't save us and keep us on the sidelines, on the bench. He generously gives us grace to get into the game and do our part for the display of his majesty to the cosmos. He's generous. Praise him. He's also victorious. Look with me at verses 8 through 10. He's also victorious. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. In our passage of scripture, these verses get a lot of attention from commentators for a few different reasons. One of which is to answer a question about this Old Testament citation we see in verse 8. Paul is using Psalm 68 here because he understands it correctly in view of the gospel but he seems to have changed something in quoting it from this psalm. See, verse 18 of Psalm 68 says, receiving gifts instead of gave gifts. The psalm says something different, but Paul writes, gave gifts. So what's Paul doing? Is Paul changing scripture? Is that what's happening? No, he's not changing scripture. I think what he's doing here is he's looking at the entire message of that psalm, Psalm 68, and he's giving the sense of it. He's giving the sense of the trajectory of that entire psalm. He's not just quoting one verse. Let me explain um, how he's interpreting this psalm in light of Christ, and I think it will begin to make more sense. On the cross, Jesus accomplished a myriad of wonderful things. One of those is the way in which he defeated Satan's forces of darkness when he died on the cross to save us. Although Jesus looked as if he was the loser as he hung on the cross in that conflict, nothing is further from the truth. Paul describes the triumph of the cross in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. I'll jump over there real quick and read it to you. This is the triumph of the cross. Listen to me. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. It's in Christ. The picture here is of the defeated enemies, now captives, being paraded through the streets after they've been conquered. It's as a spectacle to highlight the victory that's been achieved. And in this triumphant parade, the victor is generously lavishing gifts upon his people who are celebrating his achievement. The gifts are the spoils of war that he received when he won the battle. So he is giving what he has already received. This is why Paul can say gave gifts when the Psalm says receiving gifts. As one author says, the giving assumes the receiving and this is accounted for in the psalm because at the very end of that psalm, in verse 35, we read this. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. So yes, he receives so that he can give. 
That's why I say I think he's just giving the sense of the psalm and quoting it in verse 8 here in our text. Now, that's a bit technical. But the point that Paul is making is that Christ's generosity and giving us our gifts for service is because of his victory over our enemies. He gets to give those gifts because of his triumph. Because of his victory, he now gives lavish gifts for service to his people as he takes the captives, the forces of darkness, the armies of Satan, he, and he subjects them to open shame as he parades them so that his victory is highlighted and he is glorified. And these gifts that Jesus gives are like the spoils of war being dispensed by the conqueror. Jesus has now ascended to his throne at the right hand of the Father, his place there of reigning authority. Therefore, he is now in the position where he can assign to each of us saving grace and then serving grace, right? Serving grace as well. He gives those gifts. He lavishes them on us. He actually tailor makes them for us so that we can serve. And as we serve together, then the body is operating as it should properly. Now, if we look at verses 9 and 10 again here, Paul shows us how much it means that Jesus now gives gifts to us, his subjects. He talks about the one who ascended, but he also descended, verse 9, into the lower regions. The one who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. I think what is being said here in terms of this dissension, it's used to describe Christ's exceedingly humble journey from heaven to earth, putting on humanity and then serving us by giving himself over to the cross and the grave. I think that's what this descension is all about. It's, it's in light of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, that our brother Chris read for us this morning before he prayed, right? Go back there with me again, Philippians chapter 2. We read this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Before Christ could ascend to the right hand of the Father and give gifts. He had to descend and give himself. Before he could ascend and give gifts, he had to descend and give himself for us on the cross. I mean, take him to the grave. Now, why does this matter? Why does this matter? Because it makes an impact on our stewardship of the gifts that we've been given. It impacts our stewardship. It motivates our stewardship. It galvanizes our use of the gifts that he has given because of his victory. In order for us to receive this serving grace, Jesus had to descend to become a man, descend to death, and descend to the point of absorbing the Father's wrath for us. This truth should keep us from wasting our gift, brothers and sisters. Keep us from being apathetic about our gift. It should keep us from, from just leaving it on the shelf, never using it. It should keep us from using that gift to serve ourselves. And rather, it should lead us to regularly and eagerly employ these gifts that he's given for their intended purpose, the health, growth, and unity of the body of Christ. Now, listen. Listen. Think of it like this. It's one thing to answer the question, what would you do with a million dollars? We ask those questions, you know, just to have fun when we're kids. What would you do if you had a million dollars? And you think about that and you start running through your wish list. Like, oh yeah, that and that and that and that. But it's something else to answer the question, what would you do with a million dollars that your grandfather left you? Remember the grandfather who, who loved you dearly and he saved this money at great cost to himself. 
At great cost to his welfare and his comfort, he saved this money over much time so that he could give it to you because he loves you so intimately and he wanted you to have that money so that you could bless your family and your church and your community without cost being a hindrance. Those two things are different. Answering the question, what would you do with a million dollars? And then what would you do with a million dollars who your grandfather, this grandfather gave to you and with his intent in mind and his love in mind and his cost, his sacrifice to give it to you in mind, it changes things, doesn't it? It changes things. You're not gonna go and blow that money on Vegas, right? Who gives the gift and what that person sacrificed and what that person's intention for the gift is? All of this motivates and all of it directs how the gift is used. Not only do we know who gave us our gift, Jesus, and how he intends for us to use it, service, but we also know that it came at the greatest cost, his death on the cross, the most unique death in history, because the only death where he stood in the place of sinners and took every drop of the wrath of God for them. So use that gift and use it well. Use it dependently, right? Knowing at what cost it has been given to you. The victory enables the generosity here, right? It's because of the victory that he can dispense these gifts. So use those gifts and use them well. Imagine there is a giant garden in a park and a man is given a shovel. This garden in this park needs a lot of work. It has wonderful potential, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so this man is given a shovel, but he sits in the shade and he admires the shovel. Or he does what we did when we were kids and plays with the shovel. All of a sudden, it's a bow staff, right? He's playing with it in the shade, doing nothing to help with the cultivation and the beautification of this park. Even though he's been given what he needs to get started and to help and to contribute to the beautification of this place. Are you the guy with the shovel? Are you going to take what you've been given and get to work by the power of the Spirit so that the body of Christ is able to display the glory of God with greater and greater brilliance and clarity? Ben and I had a conversation about the big picture of Ephesians this week. We were talking about that, that term, cosmic theater, that in God's cosmic theater, the church stands center stage, right? Highlighting the glory of God. And something Ben said stuck with me. Just because we're using that terminology about God's cosmic theater, do not be mistaken. There's nothing fake about this. This is not some acted out drama that isn't real. No, Jesus really did descend. He really did defeat Satan's forces through a horrendous death on the cross, forsaken by his followers, punished by his father for our rebellion. He really was buried, really raised, really victorious, and really generous and authoritative in heaven. And he really gives us gifts so that we would really serve one another. And so that we would really highlight God's power, grace, and wisdom with more clarity and more brilliance in God's cosmic theater. We use theater, but it's oh so real, all of it, including his descent, the cross, his burial, his resurrection for everyone who will trust in him. Have you trusted in him? Have you trusted in him to save your soul and to bring you safely into glory? If not, why not? And you can today. Let's pray. Gracious Father, help us now as we remember the cross, the death, and the resurrection. As we remember the cost that 
Jesus paid to make us free from sin and death and Satan. May we remember him and give you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.